especially in Victoria, would have to say that we're in the impact phase. We're certainly not in the pre-impact phase and we're certainly not in the recovery phase. So we're still living it. And that's why we're shut in into our homes at the moment because it's happening. I'm Danny Vallant and this is Dirty Linen, the podcast that takes the issues the hospitality industry finds hard to air in public and shakes them all about. Dr. Paul Vallant is a psychiatrist, a trauma specialist, and an expert in disasters and how they affect people. He also happens to be my dad. I thought it would be great to chat to him for Mental Health Week on Dirty Linen. Dad, Dr. Vallant, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Danny. (laughs) Nice to be with you. (laughs) Good to be with you. Last time I spoke to you, we were celebrating a Carlton win, so a bit of a different mode today. Very different, Um, yes. Yes, no euphoria this time. (laughs) Yeah, true. Um, So the reason I wanted to chat to you is because I know that, you know, throughout my life you've been concerned with how people cope with personal trauma or large-scale disaster, disasters of any type. Um, how they can process what's happened to them and how they can get through it and thrive in in the future. Um, I guess you're not a, a hospitality. Hospitality isn't a particular focus of yours, not that you mind eating in good restaurants. Uh, but I know that you've got a lot of expertise um, in the human condition and how we deal with things. So I just wanted to get your views on on the pandemic and how you think that people might be dealing with it? Uh, Well, Danny, uh, with respect to your introduction, when you were somewhat smaller, a little girl, um, you might remember that there were the Ash Wednesday bushfires and I was away from home quite a lot. Um, The Ash Wednesday bushfires taught me um, a lot about how people respond in disasters. And when you ask about how to conceptualize this pandemic, well, it is a disaster. Uh, And um, it's certainly not a disaster like the bushfires, which, by the way, we suffered just before the pandemic. Uh, But they do have a lot in common uh, underlying them. I mean, each disaster is quite different, like the the bushfires and the pandemic are very different, but they have underlying features. And one of the ways that I think about this disaster and other disasters as well is, first of all, the format, the features, um, and then the content. So like the features, every disaster will have a beginning, a middle, an end, we call them different phases of disaster, like pre-impact, impact, post-impact, recovery. Uh, and then uh, there are other parameters, like are we dealing with an individual, a family, a community? Uh, it may be, with your, in your case, a particular profession uh, in a particular place. So in other words, you define the parameters in order to be able to orientate. Uh, where are you? Who are you? Uh, what What is the timing of this? And then come the content. And I think in terms of two types of content, one is the mind and the other is the heart. So with regard to the mind, Um, What are you doing? How are you assessing this? Uh, Are you clear what um, the stress is, what you have to do? Or are you confused or are you paralyzed? So that is the mind. And then the heart, um, are you anxious? Are you sad? Uh, What are the emotions that you're feeling? Uh, Longing, guilt, shame, anger, uh, feeling let down, hopeful, and all that sort of thing. So these are the ways of thinking and orientating around um, a very stressful or traumatic situation. So uh, what are some of the things that people might feel during a disaster? Well, what they might feel will depend on 
uh, what it is that they are motivated to do at that time. So, for instance, um, you might want to rescue someone. And if you can't rescue them, then you might feel a tremendous guilt. Or you might feel that I'm lucky, uh, somebody else is suffering and I'm not, and then you might suffer survivor guilt. Uh, you might feel uh, helpless because you don't. There's nothing you can do at that particular time. Um, or you might feel angry, depending on um, wanting others to do something for you that they are not doing. Uh, or you want something clarified and it's not being clarified. Uh, you might feel. Um, you might feel sad. You know, because you've lost something, you're, you're totally aggrieved. You might feel terrified of um, where the next meal is coming from, or if, uh, if you know where this meal is coming from, but what about the meal in two weeks' time? So a lot of the feelings and the motivations that come from them depend on the particular situation or the, and how you perceive that situation. I, th I think, you know, as you went through that list, you know, I, I, I imagine that people listening to it would feel a lot of comfort in having some of their feelings recognised because I, I think, you know, survivor guilt I think is one thing. You know, I was just talking to someone earlier today and, and they I said, how are you doing? And they said, oh, you know, I'm fine. But if, um, if, if it sounds weird but I actually feel bad about being fine and... Uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to have to talk to Dad about that because that's that's something that you would you would understand. It's it's so it, there are feelings that you have that you almost you you have the feeling, and that's that's one thing that's that's difficult to deal with. But then you feel bad about having the feeling. So I think to have have those feelings and responses named is is a really important part of the process, isn't it? I think it is extremely important, and. Um... Just with regard to what you said, it's uh, quite amazing, really, because um, the first um, contact that we had with people in the Ash Wednesday bushfires was in a pub. And I just asked um, this group of men who, was, who were just there, and I said, well, I didn't know what to ask, but so I just asked my usual question of all the things that worry you, what worries you the most. And they looked blank, and then they said, because my house is standing. And I said, what? Your house is standing? Yeah, yeah. I feel terrible about that. I thought they were crazy. I said, why do you feel so terrible about that? I said, well, because my neighbours uh, has been burnt down, and they've worked for three years uh, on that house, and just after they finished, it burnt. And here is my old house, and it's standing. And it's intolerable. So, yeah, yeah. And as you said, uh, once it's identified <clears throat> and you understand why, there is a reason why you feel guilty. You know, the survivor guilt isn't there for nothing. Uh, and it is because in most situations, actually, if you're better off than your neighbor, this guilt will motivate you to help your neighbor. Uh, if you can't help them, the feeling stays and you don't know what to do with it. But in sort of, <laughs> let's say, everyday disaster situations, that guilt uh, will motivate you to actually help someone. And it's really good for the community because the community survives through these emotions. Um, so most people survive uh, through these emotions that people have. Uh, we can call them survivor instincts, if you like, and um, some of them relate to the welfare of the community, not just to one's own welfare. That's that's really amazing. So it's so you're saying that there's actually a point to those feelings. It's it's part of the human design or part of society's design. Well, it's uh, evolutionary design. Um, uh, we actually share. Um, we think we share a lot of the emotions with other mammals because we see them reacting similarly in disasters. I think guilt and shame are probably more human than, well, they are more human than animal feelings. But, yeah, they are part of that spectrum. 
And all these emotions that people feel actually have a purpose. And I think that's really important to understand. And even if they are feelings of helplessness, and see, when other people see somebody helpless, their natural instinct will be to rescue them and help them. So even the helpless feelings have a survival value. I guess that it's different, though, if someone is helpless but nobody knows that they're helpless. Yes, uh, well, <laughs> these uh, feelings don't always work. You know, the motivations uh, sometimes come up against brick walls or they cry out in the wilderness. Um, it's, um, they are useful in, like, statistically useful, if you like, most of the time they are useful or they have helped people to survive. But no, no, you're often, well, not only that, first of all, you're often left with the unsatisfied emotion um, and actually you're always left with some unsatisfied emotion because you can't satisfy every emotion in a disaster. I mean, that's the definition of a disaster that... Uh, Things, bad things happen, and you do, and your emotions are not sufficient to deal with them. That's the difference between stress and trauma. In stress, you can still rectify whatever is going on that is going in the wrong direction, but in trauma, the wrong has already happened, and it's difficult to then. You can't rectify it. You can mitigate it. You can still do things that are very, very important and save lives, but something bad has already happened. Mm. So, so do you think that the pandemic is a disaster for us in Australia, or do you think it's different for different people? Mm. Well, well, yeah, I was going to say for people who have died in their families, well, you can't rectify that. Uh, we don't know. We're still in some of the initial stages. Um, you would know better than me. I mean, with your clients or with the people that you see, for some, their businesses are already ruined and maybe irretrievably so. I mean, if people are over a certain age, it's very difficult for them to start again. Uh, for others, it's a stress that they will overcome. And... Um, they look back and say, oh, you know, it was stressful at the time, but we managed and here we have a thriving restaurant. So, yeah, you're right. It is um, different for different people. And how it will pan out, uh, well, we still don't know. You mentioned at the start of the conversation this thing about, you know, the, the phases of a disaster. I think one of the things that is so difficult with uh, the coronavirus pandemic is that we don't know when it's going to end. We don't have this sense of, you know, are we in the middle? Are we towards the end? Is this just the beginning? And I think that, you know, when you don't have a sense of the timeline, it's so difficult to know how to fit yourself in it. Yeah. I think especially in Victoria we'd have to say that we're in the impact phase. We're certainly not in the pre-impact phase. And we're certainly not in the recovery phase. So we're still living it. I mean, that's why we're shut in into our homes at the moment, because it's happening. Something that I notice a lot in the hospitality world is that people who are used to being very busy, very active and very engaged, have they're really lost because you know, they're, they're not able to do their jobs or at least not in the same way as they were before. They're just not as busy and I think it's th often they, uh, they're they missing that sense of purpose. Uh, what Do you think that's, do you, do you think that is a reasonable thing or do you think, can you understand that people would feel like that during this time and is there anything that they can do to help themselves? Well, I think it's totally understandable. I mean, so much of one's identity and, as you say, meaning and purpose are involved in what you're doing. And, um, yeah, hospitality people, look, I imagine when they're working, they're really working hard and intensely and, uh, you know, they rush around and they, they have a lot of things to think about. Uh, 
and another aspect of it is um, is that they are creative um, and then they get their rewards so it's not only the activity but also the meaning of it the creativity and the reward of it is missing uh, what you can do that's uh, well that's a difficult one I think one of the things is to not try well it's good to be active uh, if you can't be active in one area maybe you can still be active in another for instance um, in creating something in the home you can still cook at home uh, you have to nevertheless maintain a certain flexibility and adapt and try new things you know you might try or think up new recipes or something that might be useful later um, if you can keep a sense of humor <laughs> that's good um, in the bush fast people said um, well they said uh, yeah my sausage is burnt it's quite a barbecue here <laughs> you know that sort of thing it just gives you a kind of distance to be looking at yourself rather than totally experiencing things all the time and yeah you can manage your worries and ruminations and say I'm only going to listen to the news in the morning and the evening and in between I'll do something else Limiting exposure to it, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Otherwise, you, you can be totally immersed in it all the time and you, you don't have any distance from it uh, and you can't even think about it properly. So it's important to know, ultimately it is important to know the truth, the facts of the situation and you can only take in that many facts at a time. So you have to ration yourself with facts and make sure by the way that you rely on um, reliable facts uh, not on rumors not what your mate is saying or what the next door fellow is saying and so on um, <clears throat> there are always compensations there are always silver linings um, there might be somebody who's worse off than you and maybe you can help them you might have people whom you love, whom you can communicate with. Don't be afraid of asking for help from people. Um, don't feel ashamed. Don't feel inferior. Don't feel that um, uh, that this is somehow or other your fault or it, uh, it shows up your basic um, personality. Uh, you can be a role model for others. Um, and also you can cry you can you can bang your fist on, on the desk you can express your emotion because as you do it you can become aware of what you feel and you don't bottle it up and it doesn't fester inside What about the personal relationships? I mean a lot of people are spending more time with their uh, you know the people they live with whether it's family, loved ones, friends, housemates uh, a lot of people are spending more time together than they're used to uh, and perhaps you know we're all a little bit frayed when we engage with other people it's not as it is normally. What are some of the things that we should look out for in our um, interpersonal engagements? Yeah, well, um, when you say frayed, <clears throat> there's been about uh, 15 to 30 percent increase in domestic violence. Um, uh, it depends. Uh, it depends on the situations. Some relationships have improved. You know, sometimes a, a person who's been busy at work all the time suddenly finds out that. You know, he's got children and uh, they're lovable and they want to love him or her. Uh, so it can be good. You can start, you can have communications with your partners or relatives that you haven't had before. Still, frayed situations do bring out frayed <laughs> emotions, whatever they are. Uh, I think communication is very important so that... You, you know what the other person is feeling and that they know what you're feeling. Um, 
you know, there's that saying, uh, we can have breakfast and dinner together, but not for lunch. Uh, so a certain degree of separateness, even within a particular domicile, is um, very useful. That's so. It's so funny you say that because I am so sick of providing lunch for people in my household. <laughs> I can handle bre- I can handle breakfast and dinner, but when I like, we're going back into lockdown, there were, one of the things that crossed my mind was, "Oh no, people are going to ask me what's for lunch." <laughs> I can't stand that. <laughs> Well, yeah, so there you go. So you can um, say, listen, uh, I also need nurturing and nourishment. How about having a roster? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah, yeah, just because I'm a chef doesn't mean, uh, or or in your case, a food writer who um, nevertheless is a cook as well. Yeah, you can say, well, I have needs too. And people will actually respond well to that because, it, you know, if you don't speak up, people don't know what you feel. Yeah. Uh, you just might get cranky and <laughs> and they, they don't know why. Oh, Dad, you, you couldn't possibly imagine that happening, could you? <laughs> <laughs> me, me being cranky? You'd be cranky. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, you'd be... <laughs> I won't say all the things you've done. <laughs> um, so, Dad, you've got a, a, you know, something happened to you early in life that I think prompted you along this path of understanding human behaviour and, and how people tick. So do you want to share that with the Dirty Linen audience? Uh, well, I don't mind. Um, well, I'm a survivor of the Holocaust, so obviously I was a child at the time. Um, but, um, well, I was in a particular situation which was hiding. I was in hiding in a flat with my parents and, um, there was obviously constant danger and the danger for quite a while wasn't bombs, although they came later in the piece, but it was being discovered to be Jewish. Um... Now, a lot of the time, I it was like a dream. Um, so, in other words, it was a bit like now. I was locked down, if you like, and it was in a flat and seemingly normal situation, and yet it was totally abnormal. So, instead of viruses, there were police and uh, secret service agents and... Um, and people who are willing to denounce you and so on. So the air was full of, if you like, viruses, but I clung to this home situation. And in a funny way, the less I thought and the less I knew, the better it was. And I was in a sort of cocoon. And uh, Danny, I actually wrote an article for the Jewish News um, comparing um, this, the current situation with the past situation. And um, there are similarities. And I pointed them out in the article. And a lot of people actually responded and said, you know, thanks for this article because we actually went into a panic as if we were back in our childhood. Um, but it was really good for you to actually point out, which I did, that today uh, is quite different. It is very different, and nobody's actually trying to kill you. People are combining together to help each other. Uh, uh, there is no, you know, the, there's no major tragedy at the end of this. There's going to be survival at the end of this for most people, as against most people at the time were killed. So, yeah, uh, if there's anything that I'm suggesting to your audience at the moment is to be truthful, to know the facts, but to to not diminish uh, their meaning or their what, what they mean, but also to not exaggerate them. It's very easy to exaggerate um, and to have the worst 
outcome in your mind, and it's unlikely that that worst outcome will happen. So, not to not to negate, <laughs> you know, that we are in a pandemic, and people will die, but still the chances are uh, of survival and uh, of things later returning to normal. And we will have learned things, hopefully, and things, some things will be better. What, what are some of the opportunities to learn from this? What, what kinds of things can you see us learning or learning to value more? Well, I don't want to be, uh, you know, a Pollyanna and uh, things might actually turn out worse because there are often cascades of stresses and traumas. However, I mean, have a look at our government. Uh, instead of sniping at each other, they've come together and uh, they've realised um, what is important, what is the most important thing, and they got together on that. And if they carry this over, uh, this um, comradeship, if you like, to other areas of stress, you know, like um, uh, global warming and... Um, whatever you can to prevent future bushfires, uh, future disasters, if you can change your thinking of the economy from sort of uh, useless ideologies to what actually is important and what is useful and uh, how to be flexible about things. Well, all those things could be useful uh, for Individuals, um, one learns about oneself in these situations and the more you learn about yourself as a human being, the more it can be useful in the future. Um, you might learn new skills, you might learn patience, you might learn how to be alone. There are all kinds of different things. I remember something that you've always said to me when something big has happened and it's that I should really be careful when I cross the road. Can you talk about that? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, <laughs> well, it's good for the next generation to remember because the oldies tend to forget things as well. So, yeah, look, in times of stress, there are more accidents. Now, just because there are fewer roads on the a few cars on the roads now, um, when you are driving, you're more likely under stress to be not concentrating. Uh, you might be spurred by some emotion that suddenly comes out. Uh, you have to be extra, extra careful, not only on the roads, but also at home with um, electrical devices and so on. Yeah, because all those things actually increase and they also increase after the disaster when you're still recovering so you've got to be extra extra careful mm. yeah I look look more look I, yeah I just remember I have your voice in my head and I stand at the curb and I look to cross the road and then I look again and just take a breath and just make sure it's safe because yeah we really we really do need to look after ourselves and one another through all this um, so, yes. Dad, let, let's um, let's wrap it up with just a, a last word from you, just some advice for people. Perhaps someone's woken up today and they're feeling like today is a pretty hard day. Uh, what, what are some comforting or practical words that you could share with them? Well, start from the basics, you know. Take some deep breaths. Uh Take a uh, uh, look around, orientate yourself, uh, try to get the real realistic situation in your mind, um, look after yourself, um, don't smoke more or don't smoke at all would be better, uh, don't eat more. Um, <laughs> Be careful turning on gas or, or turning it off <laughs> um, with electrical devices and so on. Be ever more careful. Uh, try to make a timetable of what you're going to do for this day. Try to make 
in that timetable, put in the things that you need to do that are important to do that you know serve survival, but also things that give you pleasure. Give yourself uh, time to relax, time to exercise, and time to relax. Uh, these are um, yeah we me we mentioned routines and like you know. Um, don't get immersed in uh, the newspapers and every possible medium about what is happening. Uh, I, I really mean make a timetable, which is quite it's quite interesting because I'm doing it myself, and it's uh, it's working okay. Uh, it's difficult, but it, but but I, I think having a routine uh, is is really a good idea. Um, and keep up healthy behaviors. Don't say, oh, well, what does it matter now um, if I do this or that? Um, look after kids. Uh, be, be um, Well, that's, that's actually very important, you know. Uh, when adults are immersed in their own problems, they tend to forget their children who are themselves immersed in their problems in their own way. And they don't want to disturb their parents because they, they tend to see their parents now as more fragile and they want to look after the, after the parents. So communicate with your children. Um, if they are young, to, uh, allow them to draw or to play and they might communicate their anxieties through that. Um, <clears throat> look after your neighbours. Um, be careful driving, <laughs> uh, eat well. So, con see the things that you would normally do uh, now you have to think about. Um, you might have done, you might have had a routine of exercise. Well, now you have to actually think about it and make yourself do it. And that itself is exhausting. So, if you have a routine about which you don't have to think and force yourself, you, it uh, saves energy. Um, also, if you have a routine and you do things, at the end of the day you feel you've accomplished something useful as against sort of being in this sort of uh, fatigued, grey nothingness. Uh, yeah. Have patience. I think we need a lot of patience. Oh, yeah. No, I think that's, we definitely need patience. But um, I'm glad that despite your rigorous timetable, you're able to fit in a chat with Dirty Linen today. Um, thanks so much, Dad. It's, um, it's, it's really quite fun to interview you. <laughs> we can do it again sometime. <laughs> but in the meantime... Oh, well, just it's fun being interviewed by you, and actually you're a good interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> Must have learnt something over all these years <laughs> as a journalist. Um, thanks so much, Dad, uh, Dr. Paul Vallant. Um, it's, I'm sure a lot of people are going to get a lot of uh, comfort and practical assistance from your words today. Oh, thank you, Danny. Mm. <laughs> no worries. Uh, if anyone needs to go beyond this conversation and chat to somebody, you can contact your GP and be referred for mental health health support. Uh, you can also look at Beyond Blue, which is beyondblue.org.au. And if you need someone to chat to right now, you can call Lifeline on 131114. Oh, Danny, Danny, before you go, could I also maybe suggest um, that people look at my website, um, paulvalent.com, and go to disasters? Definitely. Um, paulvalent.com and yeah look at the disasters tab but also everyone should check out dad's new book thanks dad okay see you danny bye this is dirty linen and i'm danny valent we air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about we spend a week thrashing around each issue hearing from different people with unique perspectives we want to hear from you as well if you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you.
This is a Deep in the Weeds production.